back to the Word of God and that we're always in the Word of God. I love that, that we can look at God's Word. Amen? Amen. Amen. Thank you, worship team. The music this morning was beautiful and that we could just be here worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to continue this morning as this is the second to last study in the book of Daniel. And this morning, we're going to look at the end times prophecy. What concerns the end times? Last week, we kind of just got to there. But what is this prophecy that Daniel talks about? concerning our lives and where we are living. Maybe we're living in the end times. I don't know. But the end times, remember, started with the book of Acts in Acts chapter 2, where Peter got up and he said, in the end times, this is what's going to happen. And he, pre- he took that portion from Joel and he spoke about the end times. But remember what I've always said, we're 2,000 years closer to the coming of Jesus again than we were 2,000 years ago than they were in the book of Acts. So, wow. Are you pretty excited about that? Yes. Now we're a lot closer. Maybe Jesus will come in our lifetime. Maybe not, but, but if, he did, if he is going to come in our lifetime, we should be ready and look at what God's word has to say for us this morning. So, Father, thank you for your word, and I pray this morning as we open it up that you would speak to us and reveal yourself mighty to us as we look at what your word says to us this morning. So the end times prophecy, as we look at that, that's up on the screen there. And it's from Daniel chapter 11, verse 36. If you go there and you would look at that, and we're going to look at various portions of that. And we're going to be jumping around in Scripture. Our text this morning is from 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 17. And here Peter says, I'm writing you ahead of time. Dear friends, be on your guard so that you will not be carried away by the errors of these wicked people and lose your own secure footing. There's a warning for all of us as we look at God's word that we don't lose our secure footing. That footing is on the gospel of Jesus Christ, that we don't slip and we wander away from what God has for us. We always need to be grounded in the word of God. When you hear something, always go back. When you hear something from this podium or any podium or any speaker, go back to the word of God. Check it out whether these things are truly so. This morning, we're going to pick up where the the, the prophetic word of Daniel in in verse 36. 70 years of Israel's captivity are almost over by now. That that 70 years where they've been in Babylonian captivity is almost coming to the end. And under Cyrus, under Persia, it's almost, almost complete. Daniel most likely thought that Israel was now going to be restored back to its promised land, back to the land that was given to them by the Lord himself. But God sent an angel to Daniel with the news that Israel's future wasn't that bright. Now, imagine you, you're thinking, what God, man, this is going to be great. We're going to go back to Israel, back to our promised land, rebuild the temple, rebuild the whole country, and then you get this message from the angel. It's almost like an anticlimax. It's like you got this big balloon, and someone puts a pin in it and goes... We had our VBS this past week, and as I was downstairs, we had all the balloons up there. And as I was taking down, I popped them, and it's like pop, pop, pop. And it's almost what with this vision that we have from God just fizzles out. And, and, and I think maybe that's how Daniel may have, may have sensed at that time. In the end time, there are going to be the influence that comes from the former lands, as we read in the scriptures. The former lands. What were those former lands? And the last empire that we read of in Daniel was the Roman Empire. And it seems as if this, there would be a revival of, quote unquote, the Roman Empire, not under Caesar or anything like that. But it seems that there's going to be some sort of revival in Europe. The angel takes Daniel to more than 2,000 years ahead into the future. Talking about perhaps where you and I are living today. And he shows Daniel what will happen to Israel, what will happen in the future concerning world affairs. He, he, he takes the, and he, and he shifts the focus from, from Antiochus Epiphanes, who was this cruel tyrant that set up idol worship in the temple. And he takes that example of his life and he takes it forward to the end. Because there's going to be similar things happening in Jerusalem under this new world dictator, the Antichrist. The evil ruler didn't sudden, won't suddenly appear and, and, and just poof and show up on the stage. That's not how it's going to happen. But he assumes leadership over the world. Somehow he'll just come in and he'll be accepted by the world. It, his, his rise begins maybe through a 10 European commonwealth. And we know there's a lot more than 10 countries in Europe right now. 
But it seems as if that there will be 10 prominent countries or, 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 or leaders in the world that will come together and form this coalition. We read of that, of the, of the little horn that emerges from the 10 horns, the 10 horns being representative. Daniel 7 verse 24 says, The 10 horns are the 10 kings who will come from this kingdom. After them, another king will arise, different from the earlier ones, and he will subdue three kings. Both the Old and the New Testament teach that a time of great tribulation will one day come to the earth. A tribulation such as the world has never ever experienced in the past. Now there's been tribulation, there's been difficult times in the past, but scripture tells us such as has never happened in human history before. The interpretation of Daniel's 70 weeks locates this time as happening in the last week of his prophecy. This last week these last seven days. The event that triggers the beginning of those seven years was the signing of a treaty between Israel and this powerful leader. There's somehow a peace treaty that, that, that is formed. How that happens, I don't know. This is, this is what a lot of commentators and a lot of people speculate about. But even if it's not exactly like I'm sharing with you this morning, this is how people have interpreted this, and this is how maybe Daniel had seen us. This individual will rule the world for a time and bring about terrible persecution. He'll bring about turmoil and, and hatred that has never been experienced by people of the earth before. And if that wasn't enough, this covenant that seems to be guaranteed protection for Israel during this time, when it's set up in the temple in Jerusalem, suddenly comes to an end. The covenant will be broken, and then the great tribulation will begin, and the end, and then finally it culminates with the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, with Antichrist and Satan being thrown into the lake of fire, as we read in Revelation chapter 19. We know the end. But it, what's, what, what, what we need to focus on and understand is that there are things going to happen prior to his coming. And you and I, as believers, as Christians, that's why I share this with you, is that we will be prepared. We won't be caught unaware. That's why I took that passage from Peter, is that we, are, we won't be shaken, but we will be steadfast in our resolve in serving the Lord Jesus Christ. The world has always been in conflict and experienced war. There's a war coming that Scripture predicts And that war will be the greatest war of all. It's called Armageddon. You've probably heard of it. And the preparation for this war, I believe, is already underway. Leading up to this battle, there will be tribulation referred to as the time of Jacob's trouble. This will be a time of reckoning for Israel's rebellion. It will be a time when the nations of the world will be judged because of their persecution of Israel. God promised the Hebrew people that those who persecute them would be persecuted and those who would bless them would be blessed. We read that way back in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. And look what God says. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who treat you, who treat you with contempt. And all the families of the earth will be blessed through you. God chose, He raised up this nation of Israel to be a blessing to the world that the gospel, salvation and redemption came through the people, through the Hebrew people. You and I here this morning because of them, because of the Jewish people, because Messiah came through the Jewish people. And we, have, we, serve, a G, we, we serve Jesus who, who, is, who is born Jewish in the Jewish faith. And Armageddon is a reference to a mountain that is called Megiddo. That's in northern Israel. Uh, up, up on the screen, um, I'm going to point to a couple of things over here. This is the Jezreel Valley right over here. This plain, you'll see it says Jezreel. That's the plain of Megiddo. All right? And Napoleon saw that as he was standing at Megiddo on, the, on this little mountain over here. And we'll have a picture of that over here. But this little mountain over here, that's Megiddo. And it sort of overlooked the valley. We have the next slide over here. There's Megiddo over there. And you can see that darker area. That's this valley. It is the perfect battlefield that Napoleon said would actually occur in this time. Let's have the next slide. And over here, you'll see the, the whole topography of Israel. You'll see the Dead Sea, the lowest part, the Jordan River. And then up over here, you'll see the Jezreel Valley where those, those two lines are. That's the valley where the nations of the north will come and the nations of the east will come. And they will be gathered there in this plain, approximately 200 million people. 
That's a big army. And this is where Armageddon will take place. A little bit further, Shan. That's what that valley looks like. A perfect battlefield surrounded by mountains in the distance. The, the picture's taken from Megiddo. That's this little mount over here. Megiddo has been occupied for many, many centuries. It was like a fortress. It, it overlooked the valley, and they could see the enemy approaching during that time. There's another picture of the plain of Megiddo, or the Jezreel Valley. Very fertile. It is. You'll see farmlands and all sorts of beautiful things going on there. And there's Megiddo down on the bottom. That's that little place that I refer to you as. Um, but you'll see that this place, when Napoleon Bonaparte was there, he said this is the most perfect battle field where all the wars, where all the nations will co could come and gather and fight. It overlooks an extensive plain, it reaches from the Mediterranean all the way through Israel. And in the conflict, in the scriptures we read that the blood in that battle will flow as high as a horse's bridle. Think about 200 million people gathered there. This tremendous battle, will, the blood will flow as, horses are, as high as a horse's bridle. And they were trampled in the wine press outside of the city, and the blood flowed out from the press, rising as high as a horse's bridle for a distance of 1,600 stradia. That is 180 miles covering virtually the whole of Israel. It would take Israel months upon months upon months to bury the dead, to get rid of the bodies at that time. This, folks, Daniel had seen. This is what the angel had told. When we read the book of Revelation, we see that this is true. This is all the things that we've read about. Yesterday in our Bible study, Andy had mentioned, and I think Andy's watching this morning, he mentioned that there are 1,800 prophecies that have come true. And there's about 80 that still need to come and be fulfilled. And we read these in the book of Revelation and what Jesus had also taught us. And the chances of just eight coming true or eight prophecies actually being fulfilled, it would be as, as the, the chances of that actually happening, it would be like covering the state of Texas several feet deep in quarters and throwing a blind man on the heap of quarters and, and letting him reach into the pile and pulling out the, uh, one particular quarter that had, been, that, that had been marked. That's the chances of these prophecies being fulfilled. And yet we have 1,800 that have been fulfilled. You see how true God's word is, that we can take God's word to the bank. We can, we, we, it is so reliable. And, and these things that, that Daniel had seen and that, that, that John had seen, that Jesus spoke about, that Peter had spoken about, that the apostle Paul had spoken about, these things, church, will come true. And there's a warning for you and I this morning, is that we, you and I must be prepared. It is a certain thing that these days, these end times, there will come a time when God says, I've had enough. I've had enough with humanity. I've had enough of the sin. There's a point of no return. When, when prayer no longer will, it will change, and, and, and because God's judgment is then released upon the earth. What is so unbelievable is that even in the midst of this terrible turmoil and this terrible judgment that God will unleash, at Armageddon, and even prior to that during the tribulation, that there are still those who refuse to come to Christ, who refuse to repent of their sin. That is so difficult to understand. Everyone, look what it says in Revelation 16 verse 9, everyone was burned by the blast of the heat, and they cursed the name of God who had control over these plagues, and they did not repent of their sins and turn to God and give Him glory. There's seven bowls that are going to be released. And we started on that yesterday in, in chapter 16 of Revelation. Seven bowls that con coincide with the trumpets, that coincide with the warnings that God has given to us. We will see one of those, that we see the rise of Antichrist, and as we look at the rise of Antichrist, he'll more likely be a, a, a master politician, but his evil designs will be greatly revealed in the middle of the seven-year period as he breaks covenant, setting himself up in Jerusalem as being God. Just like Antiochus did. 
as a foreshadowing of the Antichrist. We read in Paul when he wrote to the church at Thessalonica and he said these words about this Antichrist. He will exalt himself and defy everything that people call God and every object of worship. He will even sit in the temple of God proclaiming himself to be God. So obviously there will be a temple that is going to be rebuilt in Jerusalem. And this individual, this Antichrist, will set himself and cause people and force people to worship him. This may happen in our lifetime. I don't know. But his rise to power will probably not come through a military conflict. Rather, he will become, I think, an elected leader in this coalition of nations. He will be nominated to then lead this, 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 this new world government. Revelation says that he will rise among, from among the people because of the enormous increase in the world violence, natural catastrophes and famine, earthquakes and, and, and disease and plagues that we, that we see going on in the world today. That this leader will come up and he'll be the one that people will think will have all the answers to humanity's problems. People and nations, even today, are clamoring for a brilliant leader who then could come and offer the solutions to the problems that are threatening in the world today. People are longing for that. If you speak to someone, oh, we just need someone, a leader, to come and step up and bring us all together in, in, a, in a common unity, in a common oneness. The Antichrist will be that kind of leader, giving people the hope that they've been craving, that they've been longing for. For many, many years. The Antichrist arises. It'll be a man who, who then brings peace. And he has, seems to have the answers to the world's problems. But he will prove to be wicked. Because his basic character is selfishness and evil. There's nothing godly about him. Antichrist will be characterized by nine traits. And you can write these down as we look at this. He will do as he pleases, as we see in verse 36. He will be totally focused upon his personal ambitions. And he won't be considering anyone else. It's all about him. Remember, he wants to set himself up in the temple to receive worship. He's so wrapped up in himself that he will resist the thoughts and even the solutions and ambitions of other world leaders. He won't even entertain those suggestions. Because of his public support and political power, he will feel that he alone has the answers to the world problems. He will be accepted by the majority of the world. He will be filled with arrogance and feel completely self-sufficient and have no need for the advice of anyone. Not even according to what scripture says. He will not take advice of anyone, not even God himself. Secondly, he'll be a religious leader, I believe, who escalates himself above all gods, even the Lord himself proclaiming himself to be God. And he will cause people to worship him. He will use religion to secure power. I believe there's a political aspect to this, there's an economic aspect to this, and there's a religious aspect to this. These three things will culminate and look towards this one individual. Eventually, though, he will exalt himself above all the gods in a hostile and maybe even an antagonistic way proclaiming himself to be more than anyone else. He will force people all everywhere to subject themselves under his rule as the supreme authority, and if they don't, they will suffer severe consequences. There's a price to pay when you don't worship the beast, the Antichrist. He not only attacks the authorities, but he also attacks all the religions, proclaiming himself to bring all the religions under one umbrella. There's a movement like that today, ecumenism, where all the churches and all the religious movements should come under one umbrella. Ain't going to happen. Not if you're a real believer. He will curse the Lord, blaspheming his holy name. It says in Revelation chapter 13, verses 5 and 6, he says, And the beast was allowed to speak great blasphemies against God, and he was given authority to do whatever he wanted for 42 months. And he spoke terrible words of blasphemy against God, slandering his name and his temple, that is, those who live in heaven. Fourthly, Antichrist will be used by the Lord as his agent of judgment upon the wickedness of the earth. Now you think, well, how can God use him? God's judgment is coming. 
Just like God used the Assyrians, just like God used the Babylonians, just like God used the Persians, just like God used the Greeks to bring his people, to wake them up, to, to, to reveal his mercy. God will use this individual to wake us up. The tyrant will be successful in God, until God's time of wrath has been accomplished. God has appointed the last days of human history to be a period of great tribulation. We haven't, we haven't experienced tribulation living here in the United States. Yes, we've been at war, and we're still at war, but we've never experienced tribulation such as what the Bible describes. He will pour out his wrath as a punishment for all the horrors and the suffering that sin has brought onto the world. God will have enough when he says enough is enough. Antichrist is oblivious to this, that he's being used as an agent. The Lord will even use evil as part of his wrath upon the wicked. God will use Antichrist to deceive people so that they will believe his lies and thereby damn themselves to a lost eternity. We read of in, in Revelation, in, in the scriptures, that those who take the mark of the beast will be damned. They will go to a lost eternity. There's no hope of redemption for them. So when that happens, be aware, church. It will be a difficult time. You won't be able to buy or sell. You won't be able to trade. You won't be able to board a plane. You won't be able to buy gasoline. You won't be able to pay your mortgage. You won't be able to do zip unless you have the mark. There's no escaping this for the world because people do not believe the truth about Jesus Christ and his holy word, but rather have pleasure in unrighteousness and wickedness. They refuse to repent. Also remember that God is just. He's perfect. Perfect righteousness, but he has perfect love as well. That's why he hasn't come. And we sometimes think, well, Lord, why haven't you come back yet? Because he's so gracious. He wants none to perish but that all would come to know him and fall in love with his son. In 2 Thessalonians, we read in the second chapter about this individual. He will use every kind of evil deception to fool those on the way to destruction because they refuse to love and accept the truth that would save them. This is how people live. They refuse the love of God. And so God will cause them to be greatly deceived and they will believe these lies and then they will be condemned for enjoying evil rather than believing the truth. Fifthly, Antichrist will reject the religion of his people. Now when I read that and I kind of think about why would he reject, so obviously he comes from some sort of religious background but he, but he changes it. And when people realize that they'll wake up and they say, my goodness, what's going on? Antichrist will reject the Lord Jesus Christ, having no regard for him whatsoever. People likely, most, most likely the people, and, and it says that, that the person, that, 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 that the woman desired him, that they looked after him. And, and it's so natural as we think about that, who is this individual? And then they look into the coming. The Jewish people always, the, the women, wanted to be the ones that perhaps Messiah would come through me. And it was a privilege, even as Mary bore the Lord Jesus Christ. It was a privilege then for them to give birth to the promised Messiah. The point of this prediction is that, is to warn believers that Antichrist will reject the Messiah, totally reject the Messiah, and totally disrespect the Lord Jesus Christ. He has no regard for God. He will, he will reject. He will also not respect any other God other than himself. So all religions will basically be focused upon him. And think back in Daniel when we read that. What did Nebuchadnezzar do? He built a statue. And, and they, they, they conned the believers to, to come and worship the statue. And if you didn't worship this image of him, you would be killed. Remember, they were thrown into the furnace. Daniel himself was thrown to the lions. And so we read that So, if it happened to these believers back in that time, it's again going to happen in the future where this individual, and we read in the scriptures that this statue, this image, he will force people to come and worship it. You see, when he's not in Jerusalem, his, his image, his statue is set up in the temple and he'll be bidding and doing God, um, the, Satan's bidding. He will specifically attack the Jewish people and also believers because God's message came through the Jewish people. 
and believers who have believed the message. That's you and I, church. He will actually sit in the temple of God, demand first, demanding first loyalty of all the human race to worship him. He will demand it. It won't be optional. Should I go to church? Shouldn't I go to church? If you don't, it's, it's history for you. So we are facing, I don't know if it's going to be in our lifetime, so don't give up hope. Remember we sang about the goodness of God and it's chasing after us? That's God's righteousness. That's God's goodness. And we have God's goodness at our back. In 2 Thessalonians it says, He will exalt himself, defy everything that the people call God and every object of worship. He will even sit in the temple of God claiming that he himself is God. If you see that happening, watch out. The Antichrist will honor the state as the supreme power to whom all citizens owe their allegiance. There's a movement toward that right now. The European Commonwealth, if you think what's happening there, is that this European market, the central government to, to, to run Europe, it's maybe just a snapshot of what's coming. What happens if America joins in with that? What happens if other countries join in under a one world government? I don't know how this will happen, but it could very well happen because God's word says it will happen. His God will be the forces of government, of economic prosperity, and it will be the imperial worship of, sta of the state. You worship because people will, and people won't have a problem with that because they aren't in a relationship with God. And so they have so many gods in the world just to add another God to that wouldn't, wouldn't even make a, it wouldn't be a problem to them. After all, the government that brings peace and economic prosperity to the world is the solution to all the problems that have plagued the human race, such as hunger, poverty, disease, and they throw in their climate. You know that England has the first time in England's history they have a warning for Monday and Tuesday. It's going to be over 40 degrees Celsius. That's 104 degrees Fahrenheit. Never has England experienced such heat. Ever. So things are changing if we look what's going on in the world. First time in history. The majority of people will willingly declare their loyalty to the state and even before their own gods because the state's looking after me. I get everything from the state. That's communism. We spoke about that yesterday. Get rid of God. We, the state will take care of us. And so the worship of this individual, the Antichrist will demand this worship. But what about those who oppose him? You and I. What will happen to us? We read in the book of Revelation, there are hordes of people, millions of people crying out up under the altar, crying out unto God for, he, for God to bring his judgment to the earth. Who are those people? And John asks, who are these people? And, John's, and the answer to him was, these are the ones who have come out of the tribulation. Hmm. As a result, Antichrist will launch a vicious persecution against the followers of the Lord. Number nine, Antichrist will gain power both militarily through conquests and peaceful treaties with the world and nations throughout the world. Because he's a politician, such as the world has never seen. Apparently, he'll have the strongest military that the world has ever known. If you think the culmination of, of all these nations coming together, forming one military might, one military power, what will happen? Therefore, nation after nation will give allegiance and loyalty to him. Nations that refuse to do so will be crushed and be subjected by war. The wars and the military conquests of Antichrist. As we look at this... The events will definitely take place at the end of human history when Antichrist declares himself and his government to be the supreme ruler and state of the world. The rulers of the south and the north ignore his claims and they say, well, we're not going to subject ourselves and they make plans and we read this in the passage how they then move from the south and from the north and they come and want to attack Antichrist who set up his, his kingdom in Israel. But he, they will be defeated 
And some say that these are the Arab countries from Egypt, from, from North Africa, those countries, and the northern countries or the northern Arab countries like Syria, um, Lebanon, and those countries that are further north, maybe even as far as Turkey. So these countries come against, but they will be defeated. They'll be chased back. Daniel's previous prophecy said that the kings of the south and the north were Egypt and Syria. But these forces might be a coalition of these Arab nations. But he will force them back. Note that he will also invade the beautiful land. And that beautiful land in reference is always Israel. He will set up his kingdom. He's invaded Israel, the Jerusalem where the temple will be rebuilt. He's invaded that. Perhaps at this point he sees an opportunity to break the peace treaty with Israel through the subjection um, of, of, its, of its people and then maybe even through the subjection of these other nations. Antichrist will meet his end though and he'll be wiped off the face of the earth in that late, late great battle of Armageddon. He will have his demise. Hallelujah! And as believers, we know that. And I think he knows it. A growing dissent and opposition to Antichrist will arise amongst the nations during that last three and a half year period, after the treaty of peace has been broken. Nations in the east and the north will begin to mobilize and march against him. Not the north, and not, not these ones that we've just spoken, and those that it would chase back. But there will be a further nation, further north, and further east. News of this causes him to become extremely alarmed. He becomes so alarmed that he gets mad. He gets enraged. The scripture says he gets enraged. Look what it says in verse 44 of Daniel. And it says, The reports from the east and the north will alarm him, and he will set out in a great rage to destroy and, anni and annihilate many. He wants to wipe them out. But these nations, so he mobilizes all the forces in this fearsome war. He mobilizes his coalition against these invading forces. Some believe that this coalition of forces marching from the north and the east against, anti against Antichrist forces will number over 200 million people. Some think that it's the countries from the east, all the way from Korea, from Japan, and as we go all the way through, through the Philippines, all the way gra grabbing people, Pakistan, India, and mounting these, this huge army. Maybe China will come in and, and join them. And then there's another nation way to the north that's, that we're praying for. Russia. Maybe that's the nation coming down from the north. We don't know exactly, but certainly there are these countries that will form this alliance and come and meet at Armageddon. Then the army of Antichrist will be so aroused by Satan and his fallen angels. They'll be marching out for selfish purposes, for the right to do dominate the world and subject the citizens of the world to the imperial governments and rulers. What does China, what does Russia want to do? Rule the world. It's nothing strange to them. India is a very powerful country. You don't hear too much of it. But it's over a billion people in India. Very, very powerful nation. Nuclear power. And when we think about that, if these countries join together in a coalition, what will happen? Thus evil will have reached its summit in these two massive armies. At the Battle of Armageddon, neither forces will be marching for justice or, right, or a righteous cause. It's all about world domination. And for this reason, for this reason, the Lord himself will come. He says, that's enough now. I'm done. It'll be the close of human history in this battle. Antichrist will march out from the Holy Land to meet these invading armies from the east and the north and will take place in the Valley of Megiddo, the Valley of Jezreel. And as the armies converge, the forces of Antichrist, and we see the sign of the Son of Man appearing in the heavens. Look what it says in Matthew 24. Jesus said, immediately after the anguish of those days. What is the anguish of those days? The tribulation. So immediately after the anguish of those days, the sun will be darkened. The moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the powers of heavens will be shaken. Now, this is all allegory, but when you think about what these things could mean, I'm not going to speculate, but I, I can think in my mind what these things are stars falling from heaven missiles i don't know earthquakes 
And the world will be shaken. And then at last the sign that the Son of Man is coming will appear in the heavens. And there will be deep mourning amongst the people of the earth. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Those nations that are gathered there, suddenly they realize, whoa, what is this happening in the heavens? And guess what? They will form together and unite. The enemy of my enemy is our enemy. You know, how does that say? Your, your enemy is my enemy, and then we have a common. And those forces will then un, unite against God's heavenly forces. It doesn't end there. These opposing armies that wanted to fight against each other now want to fight against the Lord. But the Lord Jesus Christ with the heavenly host will descend from heaven and he will, through the breath of his mouth, defeat these armies and take the enemy captive. We know how it ends. And that's what we hang on to, church. That's what we know will happen as, as, as believers. The wicked tyrant and the most evil man that the world has ever known that has ever walked the face of the earth will meet his end and die when the armies gather in this great battle. Antichrist will not, buy, will not die by the hand or the weapons of man, but he will die by the hand of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Scripture clearly says that the, he will die by the spirit of the Lord's mouth. Daniel 11 verse 45, he will come to his end and no one will be there to help him. They cannot help him. Not all the armies of the world could even help him. It will be the Lord's spoken word and the glory and the splendor of his presence that will strike Antichrist down. In Second Thessalonians verse it says, And the man of lawlessness will be revealed, but the Lord Jesus will kill him with the breath of his mouth and destroy him by the splendor of his coming. Wow. What an amazing event. Antichrist and the false prophets. They will be cast into the lake of fire with the devil and the, and the horde of his demonic fallen angels. In the 19th chapter we read, And the beast was captured and with him the false prophet who did the mighty miracles on the behalf of the beast. Miracles that deceived all those who had accepted the mark of the beast and who worshipped his statue. Both the beast and the false prophet were thrown alive into the lake of fire. Now I kind of thought about that. Well, didn't the scripture just say that he was killed? Yes, but you can't kill a spirit. And they will be tormented forever and ever and ever. There's no such thing as annihilation as a cult out there teaches. But it will be persecution, tribulation, fire and brimstone and sulfur forever and ever. Eternal separation from God. That's not what God has planned for anyone. God never has sent anyone to hell. They choose to go there on their own accord. But because of God's righteousness... And his perfect justice. He has no choice but to say, there's the door. Leave my presence. Because we refuse, people refuse. So as I want to look at this this morning, and I have one more message in this and kind of wrap it up next week in the book of Daniel. But as we close this morning, you might be saying, well, Steve, but there's been antichrists in every generation. True. I admit that. But what is the Antichrist? Well, the Antichrist is simply a person who opposes Jesus. He's Antichrist. There's a host of people. We beat those people every single day. You watching online, you've met them. God's people must be prepared to stand against them. Yes, there is an individual, I believe, who's na- who is Antichrist, this individual, this leader. The Antichrist, who was spoken by Daniel and the prophets, who Paul had mentioned, who John had spoken about, that Jesus himself had spoken about. This particular individual, this world leader will appear. What is our response as believers today? Believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, followers of the Lord. It is for us to stand strong and to cling to his word, to hold fast to the word of God. You and I are believers this morning. Let the Lord strengthen you. Let him build you up with a holy urgency to tell people what is coming. 
that they might be prepared, that they perhaps would repent of their sin and turn their lives back to the Lord. Warn people that Jesus is coming. He's coming again. And he may be coming sooner rather than later. But until that day, we are not to buckle under the world and its enticements. What does that mean? Don't live a life of sin apart from Jesus. Live the life that Christ calls you to. Live a life that is worthy of his name. Worthy to, to say I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. And may that match up to what we profess. Our duty is to remain faithful and true to the Lord Jesus Christ. We must stand fast, always demonstrating our love and loyalty to him. Even in the midst of opposition, even in the midst of inevitable persecution. Stand for Jesus. And Jesus told us, don't worry what you're going to say one day if you stand before the courts. At that day I will give you the words to say. And what that result may be, I don't know. But at least you'll be a witness to those who persecute you. Don't throw in the towel, believer. Hang in there. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13 so think clearly and exercise self-control. Look forward to the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. Think clearly. Exercise self-control. Looking forward to the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus comes again. That's what we hang on to. That's the promise, church. All this other stuff of Antichrist coming will happen. Maybe in our lifetime, I don't know. But if it does, hang on to Jesus. Hang on to his word. Let his spirit strengthen you. Be filled with his spirit. Live for him. Honor his name. Don't get caught up in all the other stuff that's going on. That's why this is so important. This gathering together. Because this is where we're going to be strengthened. This is where we're going to hear the truth of God's word. When you isolate yourself out there, it's like taking a coal from the fire and putting it on the side. It's going to go out. We have to be together because that fire needs to be fanned by the Spirit of God. That together we are th the fire is burning and kept burning. The moment you isolate yourself, and some of you have done that that are watching online, you've isolated yourselves from the body of Christ and your fire is going out. That passion isn't there anymore. That desire to, to be in fellowship, to be encouraged, to be strengthened, to be challenged is no longer there. Get back with the body of Christ. Get back to church. Don't let the enemy rob you of your faith. And then hang in there and let's be together, encouraging one another, strengthening one another, praying for one another. And don't use an excuse just to stay away. The beach is not going to run away. It'll be there this afternoon. It'll be there tomorrow, the day after. Come to church. Your kids need Sunday school. They need to hear about Jesus. And to those of you that served this VBS as our wrap-up, thank you. Thank you for your volunteerism. God will bless you. And those kids will not forget this VBS.